My name is Jiří Burjanek, and I have the pleasure here to be with you. Uh, before introducing the distinguished panel, I would like to uh, sketch what our panel is about. It is about our common future, not less than this. And our common future, I think we can agree on this, will be shaped by major developments in three areas. Demographic developments, first digital transformation, and climate change. So this session aims to contribute to identify the social and economic trends that will shape the world over the coming decades. So we could put it in a nutshell with the question, what trends will have the greatest impact? And then, of course, we could scroll down um, and ask ourselves in a more granular way, how can Europe draw advantage from them? What lies ahead in relation to employment? What future for work? And so on. But I'm not going to do this because I do, do not intend to... Uh, um, to elaborate on this, uh, the, main, the second main question will be, obviously, what signals should we watch for in order to head off unwanted trends? So, uh, and especially related to this, can political institutions successfully adapt to the new challenges? So our session will indeed address the EU capability to master these, and other challenges, of course, also should be tackled, and we need to deliver the benefits to the citizens. We need to manage them all, not only on a day-to-day -day basis, but for the long term. So we have the opportunity to shape society of 2030, isn't this wonderful, according to our values and priorities. And uh, to do so, we need the capacity to respond to the multiple and interlinked challenges. So I will cut short here the introduction. I will have I have now the honor to introduce the distinguished panel, and I will start here uh, from left to right. And this fits well because it's lady first. It's Hifa Graby. I understand. I hope I, I pronounce it correctly. Director of Open Society European Policy Institute. Hifa is director for of the Open Society European Policy Institute in Brussels. Hifa was from 2004 to 2009 senior advisor to the European Commissioner for Enlargement, Oli Rehn, responsible in his cabinet for Balkan and, uh, Balkans and Turkey. Before joining the Commission, she was Deputy Director of the Center of European Reform, the London-based think tank. Then uh, we come uh, to uh, my left again, um, to Mikolai, um, uh, Mikolai dovglier levitz permanent representative of the EIB in Brussels, so head of the EIB Brussels office, and permanent representatives to the EU institutions from um, 1990. I will not go through this, I skip it maybe, but I would like to uh, highlight nevertheless uh, that in economic policy, um, you were at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs during the second half of 2011. You chaired the EU General Affairs Council, I think this is worth mentioning, during the Polish presidency. And in March 2012, you were unanimously elected uh, vice governor of the CEB by the banks of the 14 member states. So welcome also. Uh, and then I come uh, to Daniel, Daniel Gross. Uh, and Daniel Gross has been director of the Center of European Policy Studies since 2000. Among other current activities, I understand you serve as advisor uh, to the European Parliament and you are a member of Advisory Scientific Committee of the European System Systemic Risk Board. ESRB, and the Euro 50 group of eminent communists. So um, I think uh, I'll leave it there. Welcome. And uh, then we come to um, our fourth panelist, Mr. Bruce Stokes, Director of Global Economic Attitudes, Pew Research Center. So um, I understand you assess public views about economic conditions, foreign policy, and values. So I think this is the right man here also. And uh, you uh, are also non-resident fellow of German Marshall Fund, an associate fellow at Chatham House. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen and dear panel members, this is uh, the uh, introduction of the distinguished panelist. And um, uh, I would invite you now, you have negotiated well, you have more time than you thought, uh, for <coughs> five minutes each to make a opening statement, uh, and I would suggest maybe we just spoke about this from left to right. So, Hefer, over to you. 
Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Lord Rees gave us an incredibly inspiring as well as very concerning lecture just now on the enormous challenges facing the world. Um, and he particularly emphasized how societies are becoming more brittle and fragile. And I would put it to you that the European Union is also becoming more brittle and fragile just at the moment when it's most needed to deal with these coming challenges. There's no question that pretty well all of the world and all of humanity will be affected by the enormous coming changes, particularly uh, technological change and uh, the planet, the challenges to the planet. And here in Europe, we also have an additional challenge that will interact with those other two. And that's of big changes in our societies owing to aging populations. The combination of digital transformation of our economies um, combined with major demographic change is going to raise huge challenges. Uh, you might remember Lord Rees put up his first slide, which was a picture of, of the world's population growth, and the corollary of that is population shrinkage in Europe. And I, I won't go into further detail on those three challenges because they've been very interestingly and, and well uh, explained over the past uh, day and a half. What I'd like to do is to focus on what can the European Union do about them. Uh, most of the planet will be affected by them, but Europeans have a unique advantage, that we have a regional governance structure that has the resources to manage the adaptation to these enormous challenges better than individual governments or indeed international cooperation can do alone. That's something really very precious, but it's also something really rather fragile. There are five resources that the EU has that really need to be directed and focused much more precisely on these coming challenges and move away from the path-dependent policies um, that many of them are focused on at the moment. The first one is simply scale. People can achieve things at the scale of half a billion people that they cannot in smaller communities. Um, and so the challenge for the European Union is to overcome the blockages to collective action using this scale effectively. The other, the, another enormous resource of the EU is sticky agreements. The EU's community of law makes agreements stick in the way that international agreements rarely can. Uh, it, the loose intergovernmental pacts that signatories can withdraw from, as we've seen in recent weeks, both on, uh, on the Global Compact on Migration, for example, as well as in recent months on the, the uh, Global Agreements on, on uh, Climate Change, these kinds of agreements, it's very hard to get countries to stick to, but the EU, EU's members are bound into a system that has legal remedies and political pressure that makes it far more difficult to renege on agreements. It's true that right now, uh, at least two governments are push testing the boundaries of those sticky agreements, and that's why it's extre extremely important that the EU maintains its commitment to rule of law. But even so, it, it has a community of law which, makes, which gives it a major advantage um, over other for ways of, of forming agreements between governments. The EU, of course, has money. It's a relatively small common budget, but at 1% of EU GDP, it's big enough to bring in additional resources when the economic and social pain of adaptation to these major challenges will undoubtedly become too great for one democratic society to cope with. Indeed, there may be several that really can't cope. The EU has the resources to try to manage this adaptation with enough of a, a renewed social contract between state and people and enough social peace to prevent countries from being pushed right to the edge. Then there's intel. The EU has enormous collective intelligence and know-how. Um, its intellectual capacity is not unique. The US comes close. China is even bigger in terms of people. But the networks of scientists and academics, business people, civil society, and state administrations across Europe also has an extraordinary diversity of languages, cultures, and experiences that creates an intellectual and scientific ecosystem that can produce more innovative solu solutions than a monocultural country can produce on its own. That's a rather unique resource as well. And of course, the EU has the power to set global norms. Because it has this sophisticated legal and political infrastructure to create regulations that serve the public interests, it has greater powers at transnational level than other regional bodies to regulate everything from competition policy to consumer policy, trade, product and process standards. And of course, most famously, it has the underpinning of values. Lord Rees reminded us this morning that scientists can help us to predict the future and show the trends, but they can't show the values that should guide our responses to those trends. That's something that needs a great deal more debate at EU level um, and a much stronger consensus than we have at the moment. 
That would also help to prevent the, the burden of adaptation to these major challenges mm. from falling disproportionately on the most vulnerable. Anne Mettler reminded us this morning uh, that women and minorities are affected the most by the uneven, unequal distribution uh, of the effects of the decline in freedoms uh, and, and democracy globally. This matters not only for its implications for fundamental rights and democratic principles, which are what makes life worth living, which are what makes uh, Europe such a great place to be in, but it's also about valuing the economic contribution um, of, of women, uh, particularly across the planet. Uh, if we don't harness this resource well, if we continue uh, not to, uh, to allow women to remain excluded uh, from these, these transformations and to bear the cost disproportionately, then we're going to lose uh, another huge resource uh, that not only Europe has, but also globally. So I'll just finish by, by pointing out that um, at the moment, European politics is, is increasingly dominated by populist discourse, especially about migration. This is really damaging if it distorts our ability um, to see the, foresee what's coming at us and from adapting from, to these big three challenges. Uh, Naval gazing is not just only self-defeating and paralyzing, we cannot afford the time. Europe cannot afford to have its political will sapped when it needs to deal with these massive challenges ahead. Um, we can deal with economic and social challenges, we have the tools to do it, but we need to focus them on the right priorities. Thank you. Thank you, um, Hilfe. And now we come to um, Dov Lievitz. Sorry. I thought the issue for you it shouldn't be so difficult uh, yeah, to well, pronounce my name. You speak Czech yeah. after all. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will train again. <laughs> okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks, uh, thanks for having me, and uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to be part of uh, this conference and to, for the EIB, it's great to be part of ESPES family. I couldn't agree more with, uh, with basically everything that Heather has just said. Let me start uh, by saying basically that uh, if you want to um, look into the future, you should also look at the past mistakes. And I think uh, especially... Uh, on investment, uh, I think it's worth mentioning a few facts. But you may wonder, first of all, why uh, I want to talk about investment. Because investment is actually about the kind of economy and the society that we will build uh, in the future. The investments we make now will have tangible impact on our lives um, in a few years' time, but also probably in 50 years' time. So there's a lot uh, to be gained from a discussion, from really political discussion or policy discussion, on what we want to achieve with the investments we make um, in, uh, in Europe. Now, um, I want to say, first of all, that uh, if we look back, uh, you, I think it's important to note that the crisis that started in 2007 is still not, the effects of that crisis are still visible, because there is visible underinvestment, notably in infrastructure uh, and uh, innovation, in uh, many European economies, notably in peripheral ones, uh, notably in the south, of the Eurozone, and that is still very much uh, visible. Now, um, when we compare ourselves to Asia, um, the underinvestment in infrastructure, buildings and equipment uh, is, uh, is much lower in Europe than it is in Asia. In sectors such as energy systems, social infrastructure, smart mobility, and R&D and innovation and education, we are still lagging uh, behind. If you look uh, at the uh, R&D, research and development, uh, it's really important uh, not to repeat the mistakes that we have made in 1990s when the US took the lead in investment, it invested heavily in um, information technologies, and Europe did not uh, follow. So um, I believe that we have to have this um, global picture of the European economy to, to be able to define our priorities, and uh, so if we continue comparing ourselves to major economies, to China, US, uh, emerging economies in Asia, uh, the picture, the picture uh, that we see when it comes to public investment is not exa exactly very rosy. Um, it is, however, important to also benefit from the, um, from the uh, innovative ways to, uh, to mobilize investment. And one of the things that, uh, where Europe can lead is sustainable investment. There are new initiatives here, I'm not going to go into the details here, but there are initiatives from the European Commission, which I hope will be translated into uh, tangible actions soon, uh, where obviously EIB is very much also at the forefront of those initiatives to mobilize 
uh, tangible investments in achievement of uh, sustainable development goals. And uh, here the needs are also very big. Uh, the Commission has estimated that we need additional 180 billion uh, in annual, uh, additional annual investments if we're really serious about um, if we're really serious about building a climate resistant, um, low carbon, more resource efficient uh, economy. Now, when it comes to trends, I want to mention a couple of them. First of all, um, there's an emerging debate about public asset management. Uh, uh, the IMF um, sees that uh, this has an, a, 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 an enormous potential to unlock public wealth. The EU governments own about uh, 10 trillion euro of non-financial assets, its infrastructure, its natural resources, um, and this also, this actually excludes public shares in, um, uh, government shares in public companies. So there is enough, uh, there's a lot of potential of how to manage, the, how to manage those assets in a more uh, efficient uh, way, and this is something that we should uh, consider. Second trend, which is uh, already successfully applied in Europe, uh, that's the, uh, uh, the that's the increasing use of uh, financial instruments. We have seen the success of the Juncker plan in Europe. That has been, of course, uh, an impressive exercise, uh, but uh, it is not, it's not by far uh, sufficient to put um, the level of investments in Europe on track. It's, uh, it's below the, it still uh, keeps European economy below the targets that we need uh, to be able to compete with uh, China and uh, the US. Now, there's also a lot of space for financial innovation. I don't want to, uh, again, here in this introductory remarks to go too much into this, but uh, there is a discussion about new ways of uh, uh, securitization of political risk, creating new asset classes, uh, which, uh, and this is a global discussion. This week, actually, G20 uh, will also discuss a final version of the so-called Tarman Report, which is a report on how to better coordinate um, uh, efforts of the international financial institution and it's a hugely important debate actually how to use available public resources to a better use to achieve uh, SDGs but also to to help um, uh, to help uh, public sector to uh, make uh, important investments. Now uh, final, my final point is of course we, we look into the future but of course it's very important to remember that there are some assets that we don't utilized to the, to the maximum. And for me, the key asset um, uh, in Europe is the single market. And here, I think it's, it's a known known that uh, we have not used the potential of the single market to create truly uh, free movement of capital. And so we have not achieved so far the capital markets union, which has been uh, declared as a priority for this term of the European Commission. And that's certainly something which I miss very much, because if you look at the survey of companies, notably younger, smaller companies, 60% uh, of them key, uh, quote bar, uh, as the key barrier to investment. They quote uh, regulatory um, regulatory issues and investment climate. Uh, we have uh, done a survey of over 12,000 companies um, that has been carried out by the EIB. This report is out, uh, I think, today. And uh, if you see it on the internet, you can see exactly what they are saying. And uh, indeed, here the uh, again, the regulatory barriers in the single market are actually the main reason why they are afraid to invest. And that's really, really sad because we were supposed to uh, deliver on the CMU a long time uh, ago. I'll finish here and um, thank you so much. And we come then, we pass to Daniel Gross. Please uh, uh, tell us about your insights to start with. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm, of course, tempted to give you our 100-page report in five minutes, mm. but I will resist the temptation and perhaps just make some general remarks. Um, one thing one hears almost inevitably in all future forward-looking uh, occasions is this is a time on unpre for unprecedented change unprecedented uncertainty. And one hears it almost every year. And I would submit to you that actually when we look at the, the economic trends and more, so many of the social ones which we can identify, put numbers on, the rate of change has actually not increased that much. 
I was just looking at the portraits of uh, Alcide de Gaspari down there. He really had to lead uh, his country and co-lead Europe through unprecedented change. And there were some setbacks as well. Uh, compared to that, we are today in a very, let's say, well-off, uh, satisfied society uh, because the upheaval, social revolts, uh, and so on, which uh, he and his generation had to face were actually perhaps more difficult than the one we have to face. So we have a very strong basis which was created for us. Now, one thing I wanted to mention from this report is that what has changed perhaps between his time and ours is that uh, in the times of our forefathers, European ones, basically the transatlantic economy was the world economy. And that changed around 99, 2000, around the turn of the century. You can see the numbers in our booklet. Uh, because it is only from that time onwards that what we call today the emerging economies have really started to, to come back uh, after the great divergence which we had over the previous centuries. And that is ongoing. It hasn't really accelerated, but it's, on, it's an ongoing process, and all the indicators are that it will be going on. And that means that uh, the European Union will become, over time, what we call in economic parlance, a small open economy. So if we have dreams of becoming global uh, trendsetters and uh, rule setters, uh, then we have to be cognizant of the fact that we do that from a relative economic and power base which is dwindling. Which doesn't mean that we have abandoned that, but it means that we have to become better, comma, have become qualitatively better. And I think that is uh, the aspect on which we really should uh, concentrate upon in the future, that uh, what we do together, uh, and Heather, I think, uh, listed very many important aspects of that, we have to do, but perhaps in a better way than we did in the past. And one problem in the past and present is that our model is still one whereby most of what we, the EU, do passes through member countries. And therefore we rely to a large extent on the good governance at member country level. And we are discovering that there are large differences in the quality of governance at the national level. And I think uh, to limit these divergences, to improve the quality of governance throughout the EU at the regional, national level, and therefore also, I think, at the European level, that is perhaps the, the, the most difficult challenge we face going forward. Because only if we become more cohesive and better internally will we also be able to regain our influence and therefore influence, at least to some extent, where the world is going, and improve also the well-being of our own citizens. So that is, for me, the one broad area uh, where we need to have our attention focused on. And uh, most of the rest uh, will follow then, because, as I said earlier, we are actually building on rather strong foundations. Thank you very much. Uh, this, I think, very interesting and um, we finish this round with uh, Mr. Stokes, please. Mr. Stokes. Uh, thank you, and it's a great honor and a ple pleasure to be here. Um, uh, before I start my remarks, I just want to echo something that, and reinforce something Danny said, which is that the ability of both the U.S. and the EU to be the normal, uh, the, the world's uh, norm setter, the world's value, use our values be the, be the set the uh, norm for, for the globe, that ability is shrinking over time, relatively shrinking over time, and that we should never lose sight of the fact that that window is closing, and if we don't move quickly, we may never be able to regain the, the kind of influence over the, over the ability to set the standards and the norms for the world. And I think this is something that should unite us in a way that, um, we have uh, not been united before and unfortunately don't seem to be united now. That's an editorial 
personal editorial. Uh, in terms of uh, the economic and social changes, uh, Danny and I disagree. I think that the pace of change is accelerating and um, we're all familiar, as uh, Lord Rees reminded us, with uh, uh, Moore's Law and the technological change we're experiencing, the pace of change. But I would suggest to you that we are in an era of uh, change on steroids, that uh, it's not that change hasn't happened in our societies for the last thousands of years. It just took decades or hundreds of years to see that change that we're now seeing in a generation or two. Uh, and I won't belabor the economics changes. We'll talk about technological changes in a second, but I, I think I would just like to underscore the social changes we are putting both of our peoples through in a very short period of time. In the United States, the percentage of foreign-born people has tripled in, since I graduated from high school. The percentage of non-white people in the society has tripled since I graduated from high school. Uh, we have seen gay people come out of the closet and get married and adopt children. We have seen the society move from uh, uh, less than half of women working outside the home to now 75% of women working outside the home. Um, these are profound social changes in a very short period of time, and I would dare say all of us agree with them, which makes underscores the point that we are all Steve Bannon's globalists. We are the people who have thrived in this changing society. Uh, in, in your own societies, we've seen a record number of, of, of foreign-born people in the German population. We've seen the, the foreign-born population in the UK increase two and a half fold in just one generation, not two generations. Uh, we have seen a dramatic increase in female labor participation rates in Germany from 45% to 55%. Again, I dare say we would say this is great. This is women's liberation. This is good for the economy. But we have to begin to put ourselves in the shoes of those people who don't think this is great. Because the reality is those people vote. And those people vote for the National Front, they vote for the AFD, they vote for Donald Trump, and frankly, they vote at a higher rate than the people, in many cases, who believe these things are changes are good. Uh, so in democracies, we have a challenge. And, the, and this pace of change, I think, is the challenge that we have failed to address. We have failed to figure out a way to deal with the anxieties, the discomfort that a significant minority, it's a minority, but a significant minority of our populations have. We have basically said to them, you need to get over it. You're a racist, you're a misogynist, you're a xenophobe, uh, you're a homophobe, um, and that's not working. Those people vote, and we need to find a way. And uh, frankly, dealing with their economic anxieties, which we haven't done a good job with at all, Maybe the easiest of those challenges, because how do you deal with their xenophobia, their racism, their homophobia without endorsing it? And I think this is the challenge that we face as policymakers, as people in democracies that have to deal with the consequences of people's rebellion to that change. And that leads me to my next point, which is the change that we see coming before us. If we think there was a populist backlash to these cultural changes, to the economic changes that globalization is opposed to, us, we should just wait until we see what the impact is going to be of robots and artificial intelligence. We know from studies in the US that there was a transition from agriculture to industry in the United States. It took 40 years. Uh, uh, about 1.2 million people per year had to make the transition, but only 58% of them actually found labor in the cities in industry. The rest fell through the cracks. We, Bain and Company just did a study that suggests that we will have two and a half million people per year lose their jobs because of robots and AI in the services sector alone, and it will happen in a much more concentrated period of 20 years. And if only 58% of those people find new jobs, we have twice as many people who fall through the cracks every year. And the reality is people don't fall through the cracks peacefully. They vote. Uh, we may feel all reassured that in the future there will be a bright economic future with robots and AI, but the reality is human beings only live one life. They only have one lifetime. And if their life is destroyed by that, they will, not, they will go down fighting. And they will vote for a populist who will tell them that he or she can turn the clock back. 
Uh, we know this from our surveys. When we ask people in Europe and in the United States what will happen with the AI and robotics revolution, they say it'll destroy jobs, it'll increase inequality, it won't improve productivity of the economy, it won't produce the jobs that people are promising. And when we ask Americans, well, you've just told us all these bad things that are going to happen. What do you want to have happen? What do you want us to do about this? They say, well, the government should just stop it. Well, you know, we may smirk and say, well, that's not possible, or that would be inefficient, or uh, industry would never let it happen, or whatever. But the reality is we can anticipate that some populist politician will come forward at some point and say, I can stop this for you. And that's the political consequence of this change that seems to me that we all have to begin to wrestle with and try to figure out a way how we deal with this much better than we've dealt with the changes from globalization that have just, you know, uh, upset all of our politics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, um, now, um, before opening the round to the audience, I would like, nevertheless, I have the privilege to ask maybe some uh, additional questions to our distinguished panel members, and uh, I would like to invite here across the panel, I think, to everybody to come in. Uh, I would like to start uh, with uh, the question where I think the heart of the things, unfortunately, is. It's, it's, it's about money. And here I would uh, like to, to, to turn this, to start with to Nikolai, because you are one of the closest ones. And let me say one issue. Uh, I was um, uh, also uh, very much uh, seeing the, the buzzword, which is, I think, needed, uh, is about coordination. And while you were talking to me uh, about financial instruments, it came to my mind that my director general of the council called me Mr. Bond because I was very much about innovation bonds and we were trying to push it through in the council. So uh, let me ask you, uh, how do you see it? Uh, I mean, uh, we speak very much about public spending and you, uh, you rightly say that we need uh, more public spending, but isn't there, the, if you take a step back and if you look at the overall uh, trillion challenge of investment, isn't the story that the reality is that we can never have enough public. Public can be just a seat money in a, in a, in a certain way. And we, uh, what we need is a, is a good interaction between public and private. Public and private. And I have to say, I have to be a bit outspoken here, that unfortunately I think we have still to live up to this. Because if you look at, let's say my perception is at the one hand the Connecting Europe facility, for example, on one hand, and the EIB fin fin uh, funding, on the other hand, I think there is still a challenge of coordination. We, someone here was uh, here, the, um, our distinguished panel members were uh, invoking the picture of a cathedral. Cathedral, yes, but are we really uh, working on this cathedral of smart infrastructure in an intelligent way? Are we interacting? Uh, I see a very planned approach in the Connecting Europe facility. Then I see a very banking approach at the EIB but in which interrelation are we coordinating those efforts? The, the public top-down and the, the, the EIB uh, bottom-up. I know you are putting in, in place some coordination mechanism, but are you satisfied with this? Uh, and this is, I think, an uh, issue which uh, is, of course, not only to the EIB, also to the other panel members. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I mean, there are many uh, aspects to what, uh, you've been what you mentioned, but I think um, indeed, public money is, uh, what you say, seed money. I mean, it is, uh, so if we, we can only succeed, uh, both in Europe and globally, if we take seriously the idea of crowding in the uh, private sector. Uh, and this is why you need, indeed, uh, to capitalize on the trends. Uh, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned the um, SDGs uh, and the way how we can mobilize uh, the, the so-called sustainable finance. Uh, but crowding in private sector, for example, means crowding in uh, the money which is available from insurance uh, companies, uh, co uh, insurance sector, which complains a lot that uh, because of the, some regulatory issues, and I mentioned just briefly without explaining it, the, uh, the so-called asset class, uh, they cannot really invest uh, uh, as much as they would like to. And that's a serious, serious issue. So for me, still, it's very much about regulation, stupid, if I can say. Mm -hmm. 
that way. Uh, that's one point. Secondly, uh, indeed, crowding in is especially crucial when you think about global perspective. Uh, Law 3 said so much uh, and eloquently, obviously, about Africa. I'm not going to repeat his points. Uh, but this is what we are trying to do in Africa and in other ACP regions. Uh, we try to, to be the public investor that will bring other investors uh, on board. Because uh, if you have, for example, EIB or a similar uh, financial institution uh, joining a project, that is a very good sign for many potential investors from the private sectors. And that's, that's the idea. So, uh, indeed, um, I, I agree with, uh, with you on that. I would simply uh, add one other element. I think it's also, we have to think seriously. I mean, uh, that in this period of st instability, uh, with the financial markets which can move, uh, well, which can uh, still undergo shocks he here or there, and uh, shocks could, could come from different parts of the world, uh, I would say that it's very important to make our economies uh, resilient. Uh, what I mean by this is, of course, uh, first of all, to make sure that we uh, we try to build more solid uh, um, uh, economic and monetary union here in the European, uh, in the EU. Of course, I worry equally about the country I know best, Poland, which is outside the Eurozone, and I worry what uh, would happen to the UK when it's out of the EU. But I'm still worrying much about the, the EMU because that's the, the core of the European project. And, uh, and here, I'm, I'm afraid we are losing a lot of time these days. A lot of political momentum has been lost, and it's really dramatic. Because if there's another shock, we're going to pay very dearly for that. And here, when I say speak about re res uh, resilience, there's, there are concrete ideas that are being discussed. For example, the, the question of the so-called the, the insurance scheme for the, for the public investment in member states. So, so the so-called investment protection scheme. It would not be very big scale, but it would be a signal that we take seriously uh, the issue of resilience in the Eurozone. We take it up. And I think it would be also a very good sign. It's important for investment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, on this question, uh, well, let me just react by, by the fact that I fully agree with, with the, especially with the last uh, issue, because uh, basically the problem is, let's face it, uh, that there are also member states who don't even claim not to have fulfilled all criteria for the euro accession and just don't join. Uh, so this is a problem. But anyway, uh, thank you for your insights. Uh, I think that um, uh, I would like to ask now Hefer on uh, the issue of the challenges of demographics. Uh, they are obvious, you described it. Uh, we have a challenge of aging population. How can we tackle this, and uh, how can we ensure sustainability? That's, I think, the buzzword of the social services. Well, this is a, a classic collective action problem as well as a, a political economic conundrum. Um, uh, you know, as, as Daniel was just saying, uh, well, as Bruce was saying, economic change will upset our politics. And in addition to the losers from the next phase of massive labor market change, not no longer because of globalization, but rather because of automation, um, there will also be the dis, uh, disproportionate impact of gray power in our democracies. Um, as aging populations mean that um, uh, the, the older voters who want to preserve their pensions and their um, health care and, and other um, current uh, entitlements uh, prefer to, to spend public, uh, public money on that rather than on education, reskilling of the young. So these inter the question of intergenerational justice is really important on this. And also, what's fascinating about this subject is, as societies in, in Europe in particular, because we have um, a much more um, uh, sophisticated and, and costly welfare state than elsewhere in the world, um, that that uh, particular conundrum is going to become ever more acute. But at the same time, um, societies will be hit by the impact of digitization, which affects very much, as, as you and Daniel were pointing out, um, the, who will be employed. Um, and it's uh, difficult to see what the age structure of that will be at this point. Is it going to be more younger workers, more older workers? But you've got a double whammy, essentially, on societies of, of aging plus digital. Um, and it's, it, knowing, it's actually quite hard to know in advance who will be the losers from that. So uh, what I would suggest is, is 
two two things. One is at national level, obviously there needs to be a renegotiation of social contracts, and that means that national politicians are going to have to start talking about this with the public. At the moment, there is hardly any deliberation in our politics about uh, about this issue. No politician wants to stand up and be the first to say, I've got really, really bad news to give you. <laughs> um, that's bound to be a vote loser, uh, particularly um, the, the big mainstream parties, which actually depend more on, on the grey vote as well. Um, but at the same time, the European Union um, faces a major challenge because this, this is an issue that's going to have cross-border consequences. It will have spillover effects because, of course, throughout, I'm glad to say, at least 27 member states, there will continue to be free movement of people and free movement of labor. Um, and that means that uh, if people uh, feel that the opportunities are going to be better in other member states, they, they will move there, as happens on a rather small scale at the moment. Now, that will raise again the issue, not so much about free movement of labor, but of access to welfare systems, access to benefits, both in contributory and non-contributory systems. So there will need to be EU-level coordination of that issue. Um, and I would suggest that um, here the politics matters too. Uh, I mean, uh, Daniel Gross was, was pointing out uh, the need to focus attention on building stronger foundations in terms of governance. We also need to build stronger foundations in terms of the expectations of citizens, um, of what the state can provide in the future, to have a reality check on the fact that this, this past 60 years has been an extraordinary period, not only of peace and stability, but also of economic growth and very high revenues to states from labor, essentially. Most of, of the around 45 to to 49% of GDP that states uh, take and account for and spend in Europe um, is because of taxes on labor. As the taxes on labor reduced and that revenue stream uh, comes to diminishes across Europe, what kind of pan-European coordination of, of expectations of citizens can be set so that there isn't just the political trap of all politicians trying to avoid this question until the very last moment? Um, and I would just uh, conclude by, by uh, taking up Bruce's point about the closing window of opportunity. There was a rather interesting window of opportunity for the EU to have a role in providing benefits directly to citizens um, during the Euro crisis. There was talk at that time of setting up some kind of pan-European unemployment insurance scheme. Um, this failed because of the opposition, particularly of uh, the, the net creditors, um, the, the creditors and, and net payers into the EU budget who were concerned about creating new liabilities. But I think this issue will actually return because if the EU remains the source of bad news, of fiscal discipline, um, while it's always the nation state which provides benefits directly to citizens. If there are no checks from Brussels to citizens, only into states, and then states send the checks to the citizens, that does have political consequences. Uh, it would be better not just to have a la peitsche, keine Zuckerbrot, as the Germans say, all, carrot and no, uh, all stick and no carrot from the EU level. It would actually be rather good politically, it seems to me, if the European Union provided some benefits directly to citizens, uh, beyond, of course, the, the, the rights and policies that they currently enjoy, but something that they can actually feel tangibly. Thank you. I see some questions, but uh, I would say we, for the sake of fairness, we will finish here a bit uh, the um, interventions on the colleagues and then we'll make an overall round. Uh, uh, maybe uh, an issue for, to elaborate um, uh, to Mr. Gross is, uh, to Daniel, is uh, the issue of convergence and, and growth. Uh, can you share with us maybe your opinion on how can uh, be done to limit and reverse the growing inequalities and what uh, kind of policies would risk undermining economic recovery? If you, short statement and then, yeah, please. Yeah, let me also take this occasion to comment very briefly on the demographic challenge. I remain an unreconstructed realist and optimist uh, <laughs> on both accounts. On the demographic challenge, uh, I invite you to look at figure three in the report, page five, where we actually show that uh, what is happening in Europe is not only the uh, aging, but also a substantial upgrading of the level of education of the population. And those with higher levels of education are in general much more uh, in the labor force, and they're also much more flexible. Actually, our figures indicate that until around 25, the impact of higher labor force participation rate and the aging will roughly offset each other. So I don't know what happens until 20, 2100, but for the next, whatever, seven to 10 years, it doesn't look so bad, properly managed. Of course, the real challenge is to see that we need more flexibility in retirement. 
because there's this huge difference between the highly educated who can work much longer and would like to in many cases, and those who have difficult uh, conditions, working conditions, difficult health conditions, and who would like to, to stop earlier. That is, I think, the real difficulty. To, and I come back to what I said earlier, managing differentials and complex situations, that is our challenge. On, the, on the inequalities, uh, first of all, what we actually find is that convergence is happening in Europe, east-west, it's textbook, it uh, uh, goes very well, north-south in the Euro area, we had a serious problem, uh, but uh, otherwise I would say, also looking forward for the south, except for the countries which have domestic governance challenges, which are basically two, um, convergence is set to continue. And then we hear this mantra about rising inequalities. Actually, what you find is rising inequality in the indicators of inequality. Meaning, uh, uh, you always have for every country at least a dozen indicators, Gini coefficient 9 to, to 10, 80 to 2, whatever, uh, skilled versus unskilled. And uh, you always find some indicators which increase more inequality. And it is true that it takes the last 50 years there has been a generalized increase in inequality. If you, however, take the last 20 years when we have accelerating globalization, and if you look at the European Union, in particular at the continental European Union, you find as many countries where the predominance of the indicators is uh, showing less inequality as you find indicators showing more inequality. So, as I said earlier, it's a very uh, differentiated picture from country to country, if you want from sector to sector. For the United States, which everybody cites, yes, the trend has continued over the last 20 years. For the continental European Union, I would say sweeping statements that we have an ever-increasing degree of inequality is wrong. And uh, I think they, of course, things to be learned from the countries which do better and to unlearn from those who do worse. Uh, but uh, this is not something which we have to lament as being a trend uh, which is uh, destroying us. It is more, in my view, an impression uh, than actual effect. Okay, thank you very much. So this is a very mixed issue which nevertheless gives us a partially optimism. Uh, uh, then I would uh, finalize here the round of questions to the panel uh, from my side with the question to um, Bruce uh, in respect, of course, the transatlantic comparison. So uh, regarding the anti-establishment uh, sentiment, uh, Bruce, uh, do you see a significant divergence uh, in attitudes on either side of the Atlantic or divergence? in the factors driving to the lack of confidence in political institutions, uh, and how can we respond to this? Well, our surveys show that uh, despite the uh, low level of support for institutions in Europe, depending on how you measure them and which institutions you're talking about, whether it's the EU parliament or whether it's the national parliaments or the government or, or even democracy itself, uh, there's higher support in Europe than there is in the United States uh, for and most of these measures. Uh, I, I don't remember what the most recent uh, public support for the European Parliament was. Uh, it was 35, 40 percent, something like that. Uh, that that's about twice what the support is for the U.S. Congress uh, at this point, and the U.S. Congress support is actually up a little bit. Um, but national parliaments uh, are are uh, not that much more respected uh, in Europe. Now, of course, it depends on the country. Um, and when we've asked about democracy, we find that uh, people are uh, generally share some of the same frustrations Americans do, that uh, they don't believe elected politicians listen to them. Uh, we did a very interesting survey uh, in October where we asked people in the United States uh, if you brought a problem to a member of Congress, do you think they could solve it? And, and basically, a majority of people said no, they couldn't. Um, it would be an interesting question to bring uh, to people and ask them about the European Parliament, whether an individual member of the European Parliament could actually solve a problem that was facing a constituent. 
So I think we, we both generally share at different levels uh, a disgruntlement. Uh, to my mind, the, the more interesting uh, survey result is we have asked people uh, how they feel about representative democracy in both Europe and the United States. There's strong support for representative democracy on both sides of the Atlantic. But there is equally strong and actually slightly stronger support in Europe than in the United States, 70% in Europe, 67% in the United States, for more direct democracy, for more opportunities to vote directly on major national issues. And I think this is something that both of us need to be both very quite aware of, those of us who are settled into an older form of democracy that there is, because of this disgruntlement with institutions and with politicians, a sense that, and, and, a, and a sense that, that through technology, average people have all access to all the information they need to make this, a decision and the ability to make that decision electronically, that uh, we may not be able to put the uh, referenda genie back in the bottle. Uh, when we ask people in Europe, do you want to leave the EU the way uh, the UK is planning to leave? No one wanted to leave. But in uh, seven of the nine continental countries where we asked the question, um, half or more of the population said, but we'd like to have our own vote on that. Now ask David Cameron what happens when you ask your public <laughs> to vote on things like that. You often get a surprise. So I think uh, one of the challenges we both face with major implications for our governance is the desire of our publics to have more of a direct say on issues that affect their lives because they have lost faith in their elected representatives to be effective in dealing with those issues. And uh, I only point you to the experience in California, which introduced referenda in the 1920s to fix a problem they thought existed, that they thought the corporate interest had too much influence in the state legislature, so we'll let the public vote on things. Uh, and in the 1970s, the state voted to cap its property taxes and basically destroyed the public education system of California, which was at the time the best state-level public education system in the country. So I do think we have to be very wary of this trend, but it may be irresistible. Thank you very much. This is a bit worrying, but okay, we have to face it. That's part of democracy. Uh, fine. Now I see a lot of hands. It's very good. So we are come to the fun part. The, the, uh, but please, if you ask your question, no, in, no statements, but questions, please, short. And uh, ideally, please introduce yourself and uh, share with us your name. Please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Katarina Engberg. I'm with the Swedish Institute for European Policy Studies in Stockholm. Uh, questions, but if you allow a little of a comment. Um, I think it's important to underline the importance of, investment, of investing in human capital in order to increase the well-being of our citizens, their ability to adjust to many of the challenges that were raised by the panel, but also in order to create a greater labor pool, uh, which is of fundamental importance for us if we are going to maintain and even develop our welfare states. And if you apply this sort of mind frame to these different uh, issues that were raised, let me just mention the shrinkage of the population in parts of Europe. Uh, it needs to be underlined. There is a strong correlation between conditions created for women to work and have children and the uh, higher fertility rates and then uh, and the other way around. And the need to invest in women and their education to allow them to be part of the labor pool uh, and, uh, and uh, increase their participation in society, but also create a better well-being, uh, mental and otherwise, for women. Uh, as a means of uh, integrating the migrants we have received, one-third Swedish population now are immigrants born outside or their parents born outside uh, her, outside Sweden. It's an immense challenge, education, investment in human capital, again, uh, and then the consequence of uh, an aging population, I strongly agree with Daniel, this should not be a, viewed primarily as a problem. Definitely there are questions to be solved. When people pass their 80 years, they of course become more dependent on care, but up till then you can use many of them in the workforce. If we move from an industrial system or pension systems and other social system into a more flexible system that will allow people to work longer, 
and that will offset many of the consequences that uh, uh, some of the negative consequences, they will not be a burden on society, but con continue to contribute. So look at the human being and the resources that can be, uh, uh, can be used in order to have our societies, our citizens to adjust and see many of these challenges, not only as challenges, but also as opportunities. Thank you. In order to allow a chance of several questions, I would like to suggest that we have a uh, compilation of free, uh, free questions and then we ask the panel. You didn't address anybody specifically, so I think this will give you a chance. Please, um, the gentleman, and then there was another. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Yanu Tutsoi. I am from the Council. A uh, question to Nikolai. We actually, we, he took over the presidency from Hungary where I served uh, as uh, legal advisor. Um, you mentioned investment climate, which is very important. That was the last element. Uh, yesterday we heard about that uh, concerning artificial intelligence, Europe is far behind the, uh, the big, other big players. For example, we heard the concrete statistics that uh, 40% in China concerning investments go into artificial intelligence. United States of America, 38%. And the remaining 42%, that's for the rest of the world, including Europe, Africa, South, uh, and Central and Latin America, etc. Um, therefore, my question is about how we could boost our investment climate. Do you see that there is a lack of political will? There are regulatory barriers. If so, what those regulatory barriers? How we could improve not just the regulatory environment, but also the trust that investment, investments in artificial intelligence, the technological development, could be really boosted in the next 12 years in Europe and not in China or the United States of America. Thank you. And we take a third question for the panel, and then we'll make an interim answering round. Yeah, thank you. And Anthony Gooch from the uh, OECD. If you'll allow me, I may make a little comment, particularly on the questions regarding inequality, because we've spent a, a lot of time analyzing those, and I, I have to differentiate myself a little bit from, from Daniel's uh, uh, comments there. Uh, I wanted to dwell on an issue uh, that was raised by Heather initially, and I, I'm almost tempted to ask Heather, in the light of what Bruce said, uh, how uh, she reacts having said that she thought that we really need to get on with the priorities and not be sidetracked by things uh, like uh, uh, migration. And, and I, I say this because I think that there is a genuine, we're caught, we're caught in a trap. Um, there are a lot of temporal issues that uh, we have to uh, confront in between uh, changes that are taking place, the need for theoretical, rational policy response from bird's eye view places like the OECD and the European Union, and the ability that people and human beings have to actually keep pace with uh, uh, these, uh, these elements. Now, I'm going to quote someone who uh, I worked with uh, for a long time, and I would say was a very, very rational actor. So if he says something like this, I think it's something that, that we should all listen to. The real fuel of EU integration is not economic machines or prices, it's minds. That was Pascal Lamy. Pascal Lamy is a pretty rational actor. Um, I would add legal uh, uh, to that. So I'm, I want to posit here um, how easy it, it, it's going to be to actually reconcile the imperatives that we uh, are aware of with uh, the, um, uh, the difficulties that we have in terms of a temporal ability for human beings to be able to constantly adjust, reform, live in crisis, etc., and at what point do they uh, shut down? At no point have I heard um, the three-letter word war um, as a, a possible um, outcome of the uh, tensions and pressures that we are living, and I'm, it's not that I want it, but I'm interested to uh, imagine the unimaginable. And um, just finally, on, on the issue of, of inequalities, uh, I think that what, what we're doing now is actually uncovering um, the degrees of inequalities in, in whole hosts of areas that we were totally unaware of before and we weren't really measuring before enough or conscious of before. So when we look at inequalities, we look at income. 
We look at wealth. We look at access to health, education, housing, technology, collective bargaining. Firms that are frontier firms that are performing really well and leaving all the other, others behind, and it's about 80%. So on that score, um, and the last thing, which is what's just happened in the United Kingdom with a UN rapporteur coming along and saying that 14 million people live in relative poverty, I, for one, would be very, very careful about dismissing uh, the problems uh, of inequality or indeed looking back in time and saying, oh, actually, this is a damn sight better than it was. People live today. They live one life. I, I much agree with, uh, uh, with Bruce there, but I'm, I'm interested in your reactions to my provocation as well. So let's uh, invite the distinguished panel members here to answer. I understand there were more, more, more or less two nature of clusters of questions, one about financing again, uh, boosting financing, and then this issue of the second cluster, aging, inequalities, um, and so on. So uh, maybe uh, let's start with the money. Uh, whoever feels responsible uh, for boosting the investment uh, can answer here from the distinguished panel. Just start, perhaps, I would pick up maybe two points. First of all, about um, a women empowerment. And I think the point that you've made, uh, you also spoke about migrants, but I'll let me just focus on, on women first and on, then on artificial intelligence. Now, I think that it's, it, it is really important. I mean, we have to see exactly what are the social impacts of the investments we make. So this is why I'm saying that by designing investment strategies, we actually design our future. We design the society, the economy that will exist in 10 uh, 20 or 30 um, years time. So it's really important politically. And that's why, uh, I mean, I can tell you what we are doing. We have, uh, we have uh, agreed a strategy and now we have an action plan to be able to basically integrate um, uh, women empowerment issues, uh, gender issues into everything basically what we do. So on the one hand to make sure that we, by what we do uh, globally, and don't forget the EIB is present in 162 countries all over the world. I mean, it's over twice uh, bigger than the World Bank, so it really matters. Uh, and what we do is uh, we have a pillar to protect, so we try to make sure that we, by what we're doing, we uh, strengthen the rights of women, um, that uh, we are able also to offer them additional protection in the labor market to strengthen the opportunities. Secondly, that we actually make a positive social impact, that, they, that we help them to enter into the labor force, which is, which is of course, a, a crucial issue. I mean, uh, OECD, I think, had a study which showed that uh, in OECD countries, um, uh, you would gain more, um, about between, I think, 6 and 20 percent um, more in terms of economic growth if you had better inclusion of women in the labor force. And that, that's quite significant, I think. And I know my, I mean, the country like Poland, this is absolutely, a key, should be a key priority for the, for, for the authorities. Well, they have other priorities, never mind now. Mm -hmm. uh, now, um, and uh, so I, I think, and then there's also a pillar which, uh, let's say what we call institutional pillar, a pillar of you know, women empowerment, and we try to make sure that we give more visibility, advisory, and uh, sort of to make sure that these issues really uh, foc focus attention of the decision makers in the recipient countries uh, globally the, where we do operations. Now, I think it's, it's, it's really important, and I think that this is the way also how the EU can lead, because uh, what we are doing is not something completely abstract what the EU policy is, of course. Actually, we, just, uh, we follow the EU policy, but it's just that perhaps uh, we could also be a bit more visible as the EU on those issues. And I think we are not necessarily always doing that. So that's, uh, that's, that's another comment. Now, on the AI, uh, I think, uh, indeed, there are both regulatory barriers. I mean, we are perhaps, uh, we are advancing with adopting, with having a kind of uh, first legislative framework for AI in Europe. And I think it's taking too much time, but it's coming. I believe it should be one of the top priorities for the new commission. Our colleague from the EIB, uh, Alex Stubb, who was running, wanted to be the EPP Spitzenkandidat. Uh, he was rejected, but he had this as a, clearly as one of the ideas that he promoted uh, to as a, as a kind of potential priority for the for the uh, for the next commission. And I believe this is this is truly important. Now there are also um, there are, there are also uh, barriers which are linked more simply to. Um, to projects which uh, would favor or would support uh, more risky projects, new projects, 
and that is a general problem that we have in Europe. I mean, uh, too much of the bank financing, so the money which is uh, sort of loans made by banks rather than by the capital markets, too little equity investments, and I'm sorry to say, but the public investment in equity is miserable in the EU and whatever the EIB is doing, and it's fighting hard to, to increase the share of equity, but it's very difficult because it's very risky. So uh, it is, uh, you need a lot of capital to support the type of equity investments that, uh, that if you want to scale up this type of investments. But anyway, so there are some real issues here, but I would not say that it, all those issues are completely, you know, that barriers that could not be overcome. I mean, it's doable as long as you focus your attention on this as your political priority. So I would really, as I said, expect a clear political steer from the next commission. It should be done uh, as a matter of urgency. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, and uh, on the top of it, Hefer has to leave. So I would say uh, we have to combine the answering of the questions with your takeaways. And I will start with you, Hefer. Uh, please uh, tell us uh, if you want to answer in an immediate way this, uh, and uh, be very short on your major takeaways in a stenographic way, please. Thank you. Just two points. The first one is on the, on the political trap. Um, the temporal problems and, and so on. Uh, what we have at the moment is an overblowing of one issue, migration, when in fact very few migrants are now coming into the European Union um, for political purposes. And the only reason why that's happening and why populism is growing is because of the vacuum that there is at the center of politics of political leaders who are prepared to raise these other challenges we've been talking about this morning and offer a way forward. And so that's the really key thing. The political trap of future shock uh, can be overcome if politicians can provide a um, a realistic view of how to move move through through it and and what what in fact what for example a low carbon society could be like to live in how it could actually be better quality of life. Uh, we don't have to assume that everything is going to be uh, austerity and, and difficulty. Um, in fact, for example, the shift to a low-carbon economy could create new jobs. It's very labor-intensive to change infrastructure, to insulate houses, uh, to, to use the kind of public investment that Mikhail Wai was talking about. But of course, states need to set the policy and regulatory framework to ensure a faster transition rather than a slower one. At the moment, what we have are simple answers to complex problems, trying to slow the system down uh, when actually what we need is to speed up towards, uh, big, uh, towards the shift that is inevitably going to come in order to have a better managed response. But I think that this isn't just a matter for states, and this is my second point, um, that states are, are they're an important part of this, the European Union is an important part of this, but in fact there's a great deal already happening in our societies. Look at the number of cities which are already starting the shift to low carbon, for example, and starting to change the way in which they, they approach public investment. Um, it, there, this is not just the top-down responsibility of central governments. And at community level, people are finding their own solutions. Look at the energy cooperatives that have grown up here in Belgium, for example. Um, so there's, there's human ingenuity here. Um, there, are, there are experiments and, and new solutions which, which can work. They just simply need to be scaled up. And in order to do that, you've got to empower civil society to be able to talk about these issues, uh, to, to be able to uh, spread what has actually worked at community level. And unfortunately, at the moment, what we're seeing is, is a shutting down of civil society space, even within the European Union. Um, you need to be able to talk about these issues in a broad, uh, pub, uh, diverse, and pluralistic public debate. So that's where the democracy side of it is really vital. Democracy is not just about elections and who gets elected. It's about how it lives and breathes every day, and civil society is a vital part of that. Thank you, Hefer. I think this was a good crispy sum a summary. And, um, well, I understand you have to leave, so I say already goodbye to you. <laughs> and, uh, Daniel, uh, please, uh, also, uh, um, difficult mix of maybe answering the questions if you want and, and the major takeaway. If you can all make a miracle of three minutes for this. I would also have to leave like Heather. On inequality, I just invite you to look at the data which we present to report page 41, uh, table, uh, figure 41 and 51, where we lay out some of the, the data. Actually, what comes out for us is that to combat inequality, you don't need more spending, but I come back to my old workhorse, you need more efficient, more uh, targeted uh, aid by governments. There's actually very little correlation between how much governments spend on social security and how much they achieve in terms of reduction of inequality the quality of the governance is really the key indicator. And then I come back to what I said earlier, this is really the frontier on which we need to be working. 
There's the impression that there might be inequality in other areas, but I'm again looking at Altrida here. During his time, access to education was really rare. Today, we have our 2020 target of uh, 30 to 40 percent of the youth uh, having tertiary education. So basically, access is there for almost everybody. And that is this silent revolution, evolution, which is going on and which is uh, transforming our societies and I think make them actually uh, more flexible and more able to absorb uh, the, the challenges. So therefore, I remain, an, as I said earlier, an optimist. We have a very strong basis to build upon. Uh, we should just be aware of the fact that we're getting to be a smaller part of the global economy. And if we want to punch above our weight, we've got to be better. Okay, so this is a very optimistic, uh, relatively optimistic statement. Thank you for this. And uh, then we come to Bruce, please, uh, also in the same vein. Two, two things, one optimistic and one pessimistic. Uh, I agree with Heather and, and Danny. I, uh, what we lack in our public discourse these days is optimistic ways of getting through the challenges we face. I, at least in the United States, we are an eternally optimistic society. All of our survey data suggests that. Uh, I think Europeans are slightly less optimistic uh, as, as, a, as a personality type. But the, nevertheless, we need to paint a picture for our peoples of how they can get through that and how we can help them get through it. But the limitation is, to go back to Anthony's point about the temporal challenges of human beings face in 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 the immediate uh, time frame. I would remind you, in the U.S. today, we have between 13 and 14 percent of the population which is foreign born. This has happened, and this is the fourth time in our history of 250 some years that we've reached that limit, that, that, that uh, level. Every time we, every time we have reached that level, we have had a populist backlash in the 1840s, the 1880s, the 1920s, and today. And those populist backlashes have been very ugly and have brought in not only limits on migration, but all sorts of other populist uh, uh, negativities and nativism and, and nationalism and so forth. So I do think we have to, history is teaching us something. History is telling us something. Uh, the transition from agriculture to industry, the Industrial Revolution, for periods in the United States and in the UK, average lifespan actually went down. The average, uh, and, and I think that we need to realize that we're seeing, we may be beginning to see that again in the United States, where the death rates of uh, white men uh, in, in the kind of upper middle age group uh, are increasing. Uh, and I think that we need to uh, see those signals, realize that something very profound is going on, and begin to address not just the economic, but also the psychological challenges that Anthony's point about the temporal nature of all of this uh, uh, poses for our politics, because these are political challenges uh, that I would dare say we have failed to address. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. So um, we come to an end. Uh, I would like to finish with the obvious to thank the panelists and the audience. I think this uh, conference part also is providing inspiring discussions. I hope that this panel has navigated in the same direction and positively fed into our collective thinking. Uh, obviously, decisions taken already tomorrow will impact our ability to act in the long future. So in order to deliver for its citizens, I think we need to master the challenges we have identified tomorrow. So I hope this was a good contribution to this. Thank you very much.